I am Selena Ho, uh, Assistant Professor at the School and also Co-Director of the Center on Asia and Globalization, which is one of the uh, research centers uh, at the school. We are very privileged uh, to have with us today Professor T.V. Paul. Uh, now, T.V. is uh, James McGill Professor of International Relations uh, in the Department of Political Science uh, at McGill University in Canada. Uh, he was uh, president of the International Studies Association for 2016 to 17. This is a great honor for us in our field. Okay. So that's a leadership role. <laughs> He's also the founding director of the Global Research Network on Peaceful Change. Now, that's, that's, that's a very brave effort to try and talk about peaceful change um, at this point uh, in time, given the state of the world uh, today. Now, TV is a very prolific author. He's either author or editor of 22 books and numerous articles and book chapters in the field of IR, international security, and South Asia. Now, uh, a few years back, in this very room, uh, I don't know whether we rec recall it TV, but a few years back in this very room, you actually uh, launched um, your, uh, you gave a talk on your new book at the time, Pakistan. Mm. Pakistan, uh, the warrior state, Pakistan in the contemporary world. Um, so today in this very room, we are very privileged to have him here with us again to host him as he presents uh, from his forthcoming book, uh, the title of his new book, uh, when will it come out in this, fall of this in, in fall of 2023, so fall this year? The title of the new book that he has uh, written is called The Unfinished Quest, India's Search for Major Power Status from Nehru to Modi. And today, what he'll be doing is that he'll be speaking from one of the chapters of his new book, uh, and specifically touching on China-India relations. The title of his talk is India's Unfinished Status Quest, the Sino-Indian Dimension. Now, uh, that's his work. Um, on a very personal level, uh, TV is you know, uh, a very old friend and also a very dear friend, um, and someone whom I've known since I was a graduate student. We first met at one of the international conferences in, uh, in Canada. And uh, TV is uh, a very generous person uh, to uh, junior scholars like me, and also to students. So anyone, uh, the students here, please feel free to talk to TV <laughs> after uh, that, even though he's rushing back to the hotel for his happy hour cocktail. But, <laughs> but I'm sure he will spare you a few minutes if you wish to talk to him about his res your research, your plans for the future. If you want to go to academia, he will advise you whether it's a good thing to do that or not. Um, but he is very generous with junior scholars and students. Hence, uh, on a professional and personal level, I'm very pleased to introduce him and to moderate this talk. So TV will speak to us for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then there will be a Q&A which I will moderate. So over to you, TV. Yeah. Thank you very much, S Selina, for your, your kind words. It's always a pleasure coming back to Singapore, where I spent several months at RSIS, and also here um, at um, uh, NUS at least three, four times, thanks to the generosity of my dear friend, uh, Kandi Bajpai, and now Selina. This is uh, one of the best places in Asia Pacific to do IR, so you're all privileged. You get a lot of attention from these folks who are wonderful scholars themselves, who write uh, prolifically, and she was talking about me, but look at this. Reverse of iron, railroads and Chinese power in Southeast Asia. And she wrote a nice blur for me, so I'm taking it home. And this gentleman wrote a fantastic book on China-India rivalry. You must have seen that. Easy to read, but so much information, even for me at midnight when I get up for jet lag, I read that quite a bit and uh, enjoy it thoroughly and hope to finish it before I return to my next trip. All right, so this is actually, as Selina said, it's a book that um, somewhat similar to the Pakistan book. I am writing it for a broader audience, a kind of a crossover book, as they call it, from the same press, OUP, Oxford University Press, New York. And the topic is, since I got this contract or initial contract, has become very important, <laughs> suddenly, because of various things happening in the geopolitical sphere. And after five decades as aspirational power, um, India is now called a rising power. 
at least if you go by Obama and all other people, and actually Obama said, India is not a rising power, it has already risen. It was music to the people in uh, New Delhi, but we all know that that sometimes uh, diplomatic language by um, political elite. But um, the point is, um, there have been a series of uh, accommodations of India institutionally and um, economically, India has, at least at the aggregate level, has crossed a threshold last October. It became the fifth largest uh, world economy, uh, going ahead of its former colonial master, Great Britain which was psychologically big deal for Indians, uh, especially those who believe that they are getting there. You can debate all those things about the numbers. Um, it is now sought after to some extent as a swing power. It is a member of Quad, and talk about friendships uh, with the United States, uh, managed a, a dramatic um, accommodation since 2005, and Japan, which was always very uh, uneasy with India's uh, nuclear policies and others. Uh, Australia, all these countries um, have started to take India seriously. And its own ambitions are changing, as you can see, uh, as its attributes, uh, markers are changing. Its elite, especially Modi, have been making a lot of uh, gestures about to be treated fairly by the international system. Uh, membership in the UN Security Council, etc. So I want to start by my one of my chapters about the advances in the status, international status literature. I don't know many of you are aware of, I edited, I co-edited a book with um, uh, Deborah Larson and uh, Bill Wolforth. It's called Status in World Politics. It has some very interesting chapters. Uh, you may want to get a copy if you're into the subject because it's one of the books that sort of initiated or reinitiated the subject back into IR in 20, 2014. And now it's actually probably my most average cited a month because <laughs> a lot of people, PhDs, MAs, are working in the subject, which was quite a surprise. Now, why do countries seek status? And um, what is status? Uh, so in that book, we talk about collective beliefs about a country's valued attributes. and um, that place it in a strata in a hierarchical order. So status assumes there is some kind of hierarchy, although we don't like that word often, but there is stratification. And that is also very relevant in domestic societies, class, caste, gender. I mean, I know many of you think about these subjects. And it is clear it's a very important sociological, political phenomenon, which IR scholars Ignored for a long time, we used to talk about status discrepancy, but now it's back. And then the question is the Indian um, case. Why is India seeking status? And what are the attributes it has? And there are a lot of puzzles. Those who do IR know puzzles are very important. India became independent. Its per capita income was $300. Same, less, actually China was also almost the same, by the way. Until late, until 70s, the, some years China was lower, which is quite a story to think about. Korea was lower. You know where they are today. So here, um, a lot of it is to do with um, historical beliefs about oneself, one's importance. Uh, now Modi and company talk about the grand civilization, and be even before that, uh, those who have read Nehru's uh, discovery of India, uh, very trenchant criticism of India itself by uh, this gentleman who became prime minister. And I must say that I, my little personal experience of that, going to the Thirmurthy house some couple of years ago, and they were starting to release this, uh, his papers, some of them, and one of them was his handwritten uh, corrected version of Discovery of India, which put me into tears because, <laughs> almost. Uh, the reason being, this man wrote this humongous book in a jail, in Allahabad jail, and it is an um, enormously impressive book. And I think anybody who wants to read Indian history and all this, I mean, written from an interesting point of view. So without a help, much help, he wrote that, and that was quite a, a feeling that we can do it. Um, and so, 
The question is, the great power system, why did India miss the boat in 1945? I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, 1967. And then we also need to know what is a so-called great power status. And this is a contested topic today because can you plan the European imperial great power system to the contemporary world and say, this is how we're going to define it? And there, I think, of course, uh, some of the traditional hard power attributes, military, economic, techni technological, demographic, soft power attributes, enormity, position, leadership role, culture, state capacity, diplomacy, leadership, uh, I already said. Uh, so if you want to talk about a comprehensive national power, you need to look at these multiple dimensions. Now, the other definitions that have been used is a great power that is one that can hurt, deprive, provide security to others. And that it has structural power, which is beyond its region, global power. And it can provide certain goods and services. It can disseminate knowledge, as Susan Strange had uh, written about it. And so a comprehensive power uh, indexes all, always talk about uh, this subject. So today's world, in the past, great powers came as a result of wars, victory in wars, great power wars. So the European history, if you know Graham Allison's book about the city's trap, uh, is a history of wars among great powers, imperial powers. 16 transitions out of that, 14 or 12 were by war. And we know that what that war means. Uh, Singapore was uh, attacked in that process and conquered. Um, so nowadays, even India uses the word leading power which is quite interesting, um, because there's a reverse aversion to this notion of spheres of influence, exclusive spheres of influence. Great power was, in the past, defined in terms of uh, exclusive spheres of influence. Some are, as you know, Mr. Putin is trying to bring that back, but uh, it has a lot of difficulties because there are multiple stakeholders in different regions who don't like that, especially smaller states who have a lot more agency than we think often because of changing norms about sovereignty, sovereign equality, non-intervention, et cetera. The question is why do states and this, what kind of mechanisms they use, um, I'll come to that. Why do states seek status? This has been a, a big part of it in this discussion in that book I mentioned and other books have written quite a bit of impressive literature now on the subject. Um, there are a couple of important considerations here. Intrinsic psychological value. Uh, if you read the political philosophy on it, Thomas Hobbes and Machiavelli and who not, uh, all of them talk about this problem people have. We are craving for recognition, deference, respect. Collective self-esteem often comes out of this notion. It also is very useful in mobilizing national, national spirit, national myth. And it's also good in putting down others, <laughs> which is actually, I read a lot about this notion of editing others. Historians, uh, for status reasons, without people knowing, so the Chinese history books probably don't even mention India. It's editing out. Or Indian books now increasingly talk about China, bad place, you know, that kind of stuff. It's another editing. Western literature is um, imperial literature, the literature on standards, civilization, especially uh, full of this editing business. And societally, too, if you look at textbooks and, and class caste discussions, editing is a big part. Editing ourselves as important people and editing others as less important. Now, there are considerable material benefits to be in the higher status group. Some of you probably know, maybe you don't like the word white privileges, which uh, there are a lot of books, <laughs> which is depleting rapidly in the world, but it is still there. In, in India, it's called Brahminical privileges. We expect the Brahmins to be treated well. Bureaucracy also have sometimes the same privilege idea that you go through the, I don't know how many of you into Indian airports, they have separate lines, means 
They come with these uh, IAS fellows or IFS fellows. They are zoom through <laughs> without any <laughs> problems often. And it's very irritating because they cross the lines, you know. <laughs> it is a status privilege hierarchical thinking they have. So there is that material benefit, opportunities to shape um, others, destinies of other states, especially lower, so-called lower ranking um, um, actors. Moral right, another big problem in this um, India part is there's a lot of moral talk, especially Nehru, Gandhi, and all that, that we have a right to change the world through our independent struggle and also to help others who are not independent uh, to decolonize. So that is sort of, it is not out of accruing status from anybody recognition. It's a right feeling of rightness, right thing to do. And then there is also the problem of, in China, as you know, the 100 years of humiliation. In India, it is a 1,000 year of humiliation, which many of you probably may be surprised what I'm using it. But um, the more I look at it, for India, it started with AD 1000, when the Muslim invaders came and conquered parts of northern India. And then afterwards, uh, the Christian, so-called Christian West came to cover. So if you read RSS, that literature is talking about this is a millennium of humiliation. How to rectify that? That is part of the challenge. So that is also very much a rectification, part of the contemporary discussion. But then others like Nehru, I mentioned civilizational contributions. I know it's a controversial topic to talk about Indic civilization's impact in Southeast Asia. Yesterday I was saying something and somebody didn't like it, which is why I'm keeping quiet on that one. <laughs> but clearly there is an impact, whether we like it or not, the Sanskritized world of Southeast Asia. Um, and the fact that um, uh, it is still considered as sort of home of some of these ideas. But then you can take it too, too far. Perceive as more important than others perceive you. This is a big problem for the status uh, literature. Perceptions and misperceptions. Ascribed versus attributed. Uh, aspired. And that discrepancy is a big problem. Because status like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The one that is expecting to be respected sometimes forget that, think that, OK, I have status. And I expect behavior from the other party like that. But without realizing the other party doesn't consider me as status holder, so which is a challenge. And you can see that in many statements coming out. Or if you are in a milieu where you don't interact with the rest of the world, you think you've already reached a certain high status. But for IR, it is this big problem of conflict that comes out of status. Status conflict, although power transition theories don't quite talk about as much. Gilpin is one of the few people who talked about it. It is, it is not just power alone, it is also status. And when capabilities increase, nations expect higher status. But as you know, established powers don't want to accommodate a newcomer. It's club, it's club good. And the newcomer sometimes has to fight its way and win. And then it is accepted. And this is actually in domestic society too, you know, getting into the golf clubs and uh, the men only clubs and all. There's so many clubs. Before that was uh, Jim Ghana clubs and rac racially oriented clubs. Singapore has a few of those clubs, I know, but now people can enter if you have money, but that was not the case. So this entry is very costly in, in IR, historically very violent. And that is part of the problem. And when you are obstructed for a long time, you generate internal turmoil. This is why, and sometimes they lash out, as Russia is doing today. Or you humiliate a great power for too long, at least from their point of view. The leader who feels he or she has to fight back. And established groups are very reluctant because there are a lot of goodies you get by being the top dog. It's not just uh, psychological, it's also, they are very good in propagandizing. Uh, listen to American propaganda about the values, virtues of American hegemony, for instance. So new members often have trouble. Uh, but also sometimes external and internal shocks, leadership change, 
All this can generate status change. So 2008, 2009 financial crisis, you know, recall, the BRICS came out suddenly as a player. And India got a little bit boost. India, Brazil, China at that time um, got a bit of boost as the leading states. And there were a lot of write-ups about 2050, these will be the leading powers, etc. Now, talking about India, what are the markers? What are the comprehensive power markers? I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but clearly numbers are somewhat impressive. The aggregate number, I mentioned the 3.5 trillion economy, uh, purchasing power parity, third largest. Uh, third largest military spender, by the way, which, which was a surprise. You look at $71 billion ahead of even Britain. Um, then, for a couple of years, number one importer of weapons. So all these dubious uh, things. Um, there is also uh, the idea of uh, economic potential. And that potential is where India is often placed. Um, if things go, six, six to seven percent growth rate, and I said if things grow the way because the pandemic pulled it down, then you can get a climate climate catastrophe, you can get an internal civil war, you can get a lot of situations that we don't know what's going to happen. But assuming all of those, control all of those, 2050 or 2030, this prediction will be number three economy, nominally number 2050, number two. And there was one prediction said, but 2050, 2060, number one. I cannot believe it, but who knows? These numbers are very problematic, as you know. Then, of course, soft power. That's what uh, independent India used a lot initially. Culture, political system, strategy, diplomacy. Now, all those are under challenge today. We can talk about it. Um, or perceived by actors differently. And so, this India rising is suddenly a topic. The Americans have really boosted India's ego a lot. Started with Clinton visiting Delhi, dancing with all the people in the street, Parliament House, he gave a very impressive speech. And then he refused to go to Pakistan, or he went there for one hour or something. Until then, Americans treated India-Pakistan as equal, status equals, linked. That was a moment for Indians. They love Clinton for that. Actually, the two prime minister presidents who made an impact, the first is can anybody say who is the most popular, or historically most popular American president in India? JFK. JFK. Why? Huh? Handsome. <laughs> I knew you would say that. Today he would be in deep trouble, but anyway, at that time he was very popular. Six feet to war. He was about to save India from disaster, but then the Chinese pulled out, pulled back. Otherwise, probably would have been an ally of the United States at that point. Right. And then, of course, uh, now he also was sympathetic to the Indian democracy and he wanted to help India a lot more than others. Although there are books that say he and uh, leaders like Nehru sitting past each other, talking, look, staring at it, all those psychological issues. Clinton uh, visit George Bush, despite that uh, ugly war in <laughs> against Iraq. He made another biggest contribution treating this country and Condoleezza Rice, uh, wanting to uplift this relationship. And they knew what was blocking it. That was a nuclear issue, uh, took out that uh, problem, nuclear apartheid, and uh, treated it as a separate category. Big status boost for India in that sense. And then Trump, of course, had ups and downs, but the US military Re renaming the command, the naval commands, Indo-Pacific Command, which is, Indians love that. It's a status recognition, which is actually nothing new. During the colonial period, it was Indian Ocean, <laughs> Pacific, Indo-Pacific, because the colonialists never looked at their separate oceans. They were, as we know, Malacca straight onwards, they all the way went to Japan, you know, and places like that. So. This uh, Biden's efforts, continued efforts, there's uh, quite a bit of military to military exchanges going on, exercises, Quad, another major institutional innovation. And so India has uh, achieved quite a bit, if you want to call it. And of course, 
Uh, one of my chapters is about this effort by Indian elite from day one to build a technological, uh, the frontier technologies, a kind of a important role. And focusing on space and nuclear, this very poor country achieving a lot, ignoring the basic technologies for the average person. And that was status driven very much. And it's very clear later on. Well, there are other reasons, but. And status became a big issue with the NPT, because India was a proponent of NPT, including everybody, except now it created two classes, which is a status issue. India thought it would permanently become a non-nuclear weapon state, a non-great power. So there it opposed the NPT, the tr most stringent opponent, then tested weapons, 74, then 98, and that test had, I mean, people debate, including Gandhi, and I had debates on this. Um, I would say it was a status assertion. It was fear that you will be treated as a second class state forever, NP NPT, uh, extend perpetuity, CDBT. Now, we can debate whether nuclear weapons bring these status, but clearly, at least the elite thought that way. And then there is the demographic part. Now, you know, in another month or so, it will become the leading state in numbers, uh, 15 to 24 age group, majority of people sitting here, that India will have the highest, 35% of the population for the next two decades. Um, I will talk about the problem with that demographic dividend. <laughs> um, in any way, this is the problem. <laughs> you can see my problem here. Um, whether these things matter or not, and there is a considerable problem there because, and that's also where the comparison with China comes in. The Chinese seem to have at least now thinking in terms of this identity that they have imbibed uh, from top to bottom, as far as I know. But in India, that hasn't happened yet. The political class at the top level, yes, they think about great power status. But does that matter for the folks in different state capitals, different municipalities, panchayats, etc. And clearly, my contention in this book is not really. And secondly, the whole problem of your number one asset is your population. You don't have oil. You don't have anything other than uh, basic, I mean, agricultural land, actually quite good ones, but not developed sufficiently. You have a lot of water falling into the oceans, but again, water scarce country in some sense. But you haven't paid attention to inclusive economic development sufficiently as even China has done. And it hasn't been a de developmental state, and there's a lot to do with internal status conceptions, which again we are forgetting, highly stratified, unequal caste system combining in many, and the British loved it, as you know, and they maintain that order. And now, I don't want to blame the British for everything, but they also are part of that challenge, their educational system, et cetera. And of course, the one other asset was the democratic secular state that now being challenged. But still, um, no great power is devoid of many blemishes. Uh, uh, many of you know what America is today, and there are wonderful places, there are not so wonderful places where you feel like, is this a great power? You know, some of the airports and <laughs> trains and buses. Um, Russia, the average Russian male's uh, lifespan is uh, lower than average Indian's lifespan today, which is quite amazing, isn't it? Um, a lot of problems in many of these so-called great powers, but once you are institutionalized, it's uh, quite a bit of different story. But this is rising power, so you are judged much harshly for your rise. Yet there is advancement. I mentioned the diplomatic victories and institutional accommodation. But it is not coming as fast as many Indians would like to. There is a transmission problem. And I mentioned this weak state problem. It's not a very weak state, but it is a hybrid state in some sense. But it has a truncated weakness. It has not adopted a, a developmental strategy that should have made it uh, important. Um, now the China part comes half of because my book has only one half chapter on China, so I don't want to talk. About, I'm sorry to bring in this much theory. 
India's number one problem has been this latecomer problem at the international level. It missed the boat in 1945, part of the British colony. Although 2.5 million Indians fought on the side of the Allies, the British did not want India to be a permanent member of the Security Council. The Australians, Yugoslavia, a few countries, even Roosevelt was sympathetic support. There are a lot of theories about it, why the Brits did not want to include. The British had India as a dominion in 1919 Paris meeting, uh, Versailles. Three Maharajas were also there. But in San Francisco, when the new world order was structured, India was shunted out. My theory is a lot to do with the 1942 Quit India movement. The uh, British were very mad that India was seeking independence at the precise moment when Hitler was bombing Britain. And potentially they were losing that too. Now, then something else happened. Oh, so this meeting, there's some interesting stuff. Only three or four representatives there. They tried to make an impact, but didn't get a chance even to make. And still a puzzle why the Congress party didn't push for it. Maybe they were all in jail and thinking not on this, but independence somehow get there, then you will be recognized. Big, big mistake. World orders are created at uh, particular points in time, um, new world orders, until the next war and post-war or some other big crisis. So strategic thinking uh, was missing in India's side. Same goes for 1967-68 period. India did not test a nuclear weapon before 67. And so it was bracketed as a non-nuclear weapon state. This is a big moral debate in India. Anybody who knows about this story, India was in deep, deep debate when China tested the bomb in 64. But Shastri and others decided to slow it down, didn't abandon it. And uh, so it missed the boat. Now you're bracketed. And you're target of the great power system who wanted to keep their status privilege as nuclear weapon states. This is a P5 status desire. And they started editing others who are challenging them. And they keep editing today, Iran, North Korea. You know, you, you see the language as the wannabes who really are challenging the order, the good order that we created. All right. So that missing the boat and then testing it, becoming the number one challenger to the international regime non-proliferation regime. And the US, especially under the Carter administration, started putting considerable uh, sanctions. And um, it definitely affected India's um, 30 years of technological development. This Indian scientists were banned from the United States. And I recall as a graduate student at UCLA, the contemptuous talk about India, which was <laughs> quite interesting. The proliferation was a big deal at that time, non-proliferation. And uh, they would look at you as if you are responsible for the decisions made in Delhi. I say, I'm not responsible, not for nuclear weapons, but I understand what India is thinking. But anyway, it's much better now, by the way. Many people think it was probably a necessary step for India to get out of its uh, this uh, fence-sitter mode. Um, and then, of course, um, it was a series of crises, 71 war before that, of course and the US-China rapprochement, and then the trilateral balancing with Pakistan. And the China challenge has been going on since the late 50s in a major way, both security and uh, territorial as well as status terms. Now, acceptance by um, near peer group is very important for a great power to be accepted. And that peer group often accepts you very reluctantly, as I said, usually after a war. The only very few instances the loser he was treated well. The, that one was in 1815. The Napoleonic France was uh, defeated, but it was actually treated very well in, in uh, Vienna. But the same France forgot all about that in 1919 and treated Germany so badly that it became so revisionist. So this status and humiliation matter, we really need to go into deep into it. And so China's problem here is, earlier, of course, the Hindi-Chini bye-bye and all that, but 
Kandi has this excellent book, which, by the way, those chapters are your best in that book, about this historical understanding of each other. The so-called Buddhism myth and then the whole, whole uh, different myths uh, each other had. And perceptions about power, about strategy. Um, I managed to dig out a few quotes from Mao and Kissinger talking about it's a bunch of bull word, you know, all kinds of fascinating before the 71 war. It's about Indian philosophy and ideology, etc. Um, I have a little section on Sinologists. <laughs> you may not like it, but they have accepted this Chinese version of India as the inconsequential player in world politics. And I have felt this as a graduate student. I still feel when I read the uh, chapters, hardly any mention of India by many Sinologists works. Anyway, I don't have any personal gripes, but I'm just saying that this, this is a perceptual problem. So the historical dimension is very connected to power power relationships as well as status. China succeeded in gaining institutional membership. Well, first it was Taiwan, of course, then China later, which was uh, bestowed by uh, Roosevelt and others. And so China is treated already as a, if not a great power, an important power by the international system but India was not. So you, you think about that status discrepancy. And then, of course, the 62 war, big blow to India, and that humiliation is still going on. It is, uh, people forget that, it was a moment of uh, major catastrophe for the Indian psyche, and India's leadership role, etc. Now, for a long period of time, China didn't bother about South Asia. Had very little relationship with the smaller states. But I think that changed about 2010 onwards and more intensely with the BRI. Today, China is a big player in uh, South Asia, which means India has to compete. India also has to share this uh, regional uh, role that it has. But it has to compete asymmetrically given its pocketbooks are not that high. And then China has a traditional alliance with Pakistan, so that is also a challenge. And the material deficiencies keep growing. Again, Kandi's book talks about a lot of that. Almost one-fifth of everything. And the face of the urban face of China, I, I visited a few years ago. And it's just massive. I mean, I'm sure it's much better today. And India's face, not face means urban space, barring a few pockets like Bangalore's uh, technology parks. It still looks very developing. And worse than developing in many sense. So, but aggregate growth is happening. It's, it's a service-based economy. There is a middle class coming out, and Indian students, many of them are, some of them are sitting here, massively now going abroad, uh, study. There is a huge uh, globalization happening, because locally the colleges are trying, but not getting there as fast as they could. So people have money, and that's why, or they can borrow and then send their kids abroad. So these material deficiencies are part of the big challenge that India is facing. But more than that, China feels threat, threatened by India in some way, although they don't want to admit it. And I think it is this problem of India's potential alignment with the US, Japan, and Australia, and maybe some Southeast Asian countries like, I don't know. Um, Vietnam, maybe. Now, why is that so? Uh, reading the literature, you are all familiar with Xi Jinping's desire to become the lead power and maybe replace the United States. It may not happen if these four folks join hands together. If, that's a big question mark. And despite all the problems we say, India still has some advantages, demographic advantage that others don't have. India is spending more on the Navy, which it took a long time because its main threats were from the north. Historically, India was not a naval power. Uh, K.M. Panikkar, the historian, has this interesting discussion about, about why India was even colonized. Because from the Mughals, on, you know, the threat came from the north, so they didn't bother about these long coastline. Now, this naval spending, not that big, but potentially, 
will be important in, in terms of checking China to some extent. And the smaller states, of course, um, are competing, and but at the same time, some of them are not so happy with China's uh, aid policy, losing their, um, they're becoming indebted, etc. So India has room there, but at the same time, India has been a, a, a reluctant player in aid and all this coming back in a big way. India is opposing China's efforts, BRI to begin with, which uh, some call it a new East India Company model, but you can differ on that. Uh, CPEC, which is part of that. Then, of course, RCEP and a series of other trade uh, issues. But before the Xi era, there was a period China was willing to share some level of status with India by bringing in the BRICS and the NDB, that is the New Development Bank, AIAB, etc., and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, G20 was not China's creation. At least there were a lot of uh, cooperation happening at global trade, global uh, climate, etc. That, unfortunately, has come to an end, I think, maybe at a diplomatic level. But it is a, a sad thing that both the leaders today don't even look at each other, which is not a good thing. And then, of course, the territorial challenges. Um, that is, again, highly problematic. The Doklam, the Dark, um, and uh, quite a bit happening. Some of them are not reported. Um, and if the Indian reporting is right, uh, pockets that India was contesting before are now on, in Chinese hands, and lots of villages are being erected, and uh, India's protectorate, Bhutan, is slowly uh, giving up a lot of the contest. So the salami slicing strategy, uh, consequences within India, uh, and then you have two ambitious leaders, possible escalation which is a uh, uh, problem because escalation sometimes happen without people realizing, beyond the control. 1914, think about that. Uh, so far they are talking. So border needling by either party, um, and I think uh, there may be a point when an ambitious leader say, okay, let's become, let's solve this problem. So what is my conclusion here? This is a highly volatile relationship. It wasn't that bad for uh, several decades after the 62. There were periods of, uh, of course, ignoring each other, but Ajib Gandhi's visit onwards. China was treating India a little bit more respectfully. Now China is realizing that India is potentially a pain in, the th in its ambitions. But others are treating India a lot more differentially from a status point of view. Um, and India has transcended its region, which some may disagree. One of the markers of an ambitious great power is that it is beyond its region, its engagement. So India competes with China in Africa, Persian Gulf, where in Persian Gulf, India has made extraordinary achievements, if you want to call it. Modi's diplomacy worked quite a bit. Uh, with these monarchs now treat Pakistan as not equal, and there's a lot of trade and other relationship going on. Look East, uh, act East, uh, of course, you can differ on Southeast Asia, how much they care about India. But point, the fact is that it has gone beyond its South Asia-centric foreign policy. It is doing stuff. And it's, uh, I mentioned the naval part. And smaller states, of course, are willing to treat India as a co-sharer. Nobody has joined other than Cambodia, as far as I know, as a typical ally. Even Pakistan is reluctant to become an ally of China. And so a lot of small things have happened in India's favor, India-US relations. I call it a quasi-great power or a truncated power, leading power, as they call it. Raw indicators do matter. So there is some expectation India's uh, peaceful integration of some form is happening. But there is this problem of reticence, as Manjiri Miller, uh, one of our friends, uh, wrote this book about. You can have material power, but you can be reticent and diffident and not doing that assertive foreign policy. And the other problem is political elite really using it for domestic purposes. And India, you know that uh, Mr. Modi is now 
uh, using the G20 chairmanship as a big achievement in every town. I, I'm actually coming from Kerala, and every village has got this G20 thing. In olden times, it was uh, every meeting, nobody cared, other than a few people in Delhi, Commonwealth, non-aligned, whatnot. So whatever little status India gets, uh, political elite is willing to use, which is quite crafty in some sense. But anyways, that is happening. India-U.S. relationship is uh, hard balancing, soft balancing. So what are the future pro uh, prospects here? Many of these achievements are by default because of rise of China and the need for some balancing force. Some are, of course, uh, strategic calculations. Um, but is it maintainable how far India will go? Here I conclude by, in the book, talk about legitimacy and durability of uh, status and power. And the legitimacy comes, others treat you as a power of consequence. And here, I think internal development of India is absolutely needed. Uh, in other words, human development. People may think that the Navy, Army, Air Force is all enough in the past, yes. But they look at India still as a very poor country. That has to change. It's not that poor. That's the sad part of it. It has wealth. And every time East Asian countries develop that level of growth, they showed up in their infrastructure, their human development, which is not happening in many parts of India, some parts, yes. So this rethinking on what is status, what is development, is needed on the elite from the top to the bottom. You have at the top, there is some recognition, but the bottom is not happening. The village officer, or the panchayat officer, or the PWD, all those fellows who shape India, uh, the uh, urban planning is a joke. There's not a single city, country I've seen a decent footpath or crossing. These are all minor things from a larger scheme of things, but they matter how people look at you as a power. Um, this doesn't matter to many in the elite system. So the book is uh, somewhat critical, but a sympathetic critic. As uh, I think it deserves a place. It's one-fifth of humanity. It's been a target of uh, upper, upper caste, upper class, upper race. And I read a lot about this standards of civilization literature these days. You feel for it. I mean, you, you are uh, a fallen people. There's a fantastic book by uh, 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 our friend Rahul Sagar, who used to be here, wasn't he? Uh, 90th century writing on India. These fallen people need to come up as a peaceful, acceptable country and a society. And I think that is where we have some differences. Let me stop there. While the you know, audience take a little while to think about questions for you, mm -hmm. uh, let me start off just by asking one question. Um, you, know, uh, you know, we know that um, great powers, right? They need two things. They need, uh, in order to get social recognition from others, whether big powers or other big powers or other small powers, um, they need uh, both hard power and soft power as you mentioned, right? So um, I can see you know, people talking about China, uh, India's uh, economic growth, uh, military development, those demographic dividend, right? Um, you know, th that uh, India is growing its hard power. What I wanted to ask is, how is India growing its soft power? Is there actually a plan? Now I ask this question because it's, it's very clear to me, I mean, the U.S. have both hard power and soft power, although you know, we can debate whether it's a declining power at this point, but that's not, not the issue we are discussing here. But the U.S. have um, hard power, uh, which is, well, state-driven. The, uh, the soft power element is more private sector-driven. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of like Hollywood, right? Things like Hollywood, culture, um, yeah. Hollywood, culture, that's the U.S. Now, um, you think about South Korea, lots of soft power <laughs> in terms of uh, K-pop, mm. attractiveness of its culture, uh, you know, K-pop and the whole industry. Uh, but it is a middle power in terms of its hard power. So in, 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 in China's case, uh, hard power is def has definitely grown, right? Um, but there is a state-driven approach to also promote soft power. Mm. Um, you can see that in, in the BRI, exporting technology and finance, making the Chinese model attractive, right? 
uh, it is uh, also about you know growing, uh, pouring tons of money into Chinese universities like Tsinghua and Beida and growing its uh, international reputation, making it an attractive place uh, for talent and students to come in, right? Um, you know, and, and Chinese uh, television and drama actually has grown a lot in the last uh, few years. Uh, and it has been, last decade or so, it's actually been uh, growing in attractiveness. Uh, no more, you know, those uh, dreary PLA stories, but a lot of things about how great Chinese civilization is. And, you know, there's a civilizational narrative that's put mm. out there. There's this idea of a Chinese dream. There is, um, you know... Uh, uh, all, all the stuff that Xi Jinping has been pouring out, uh, harmonious society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very state-driven. When you talk about, I don't know uh, uh, what you might have put in your chapter three, but I'm wondering whether you can elaborate more on India's soft power strategy. I mean, mm. is the government doing anything deliberately, or is it being left out uh, to the private sector? And what would be the elements of? Uh, India's soft power. <laughs> you you talk about the elements of yeah, we talk about attraction. Right? Soft power is about attraction. Mm -hmm. So human development index is a problem. Um, it is a hard power in a sense, but it is also is your country uh, developing the educational system, etc., developing its people such that you become an attractive model. Then it becomes a form of soft power. Mm -hmm. So so is there is is it state driven? Is there any effort by the Modi government, or is this mainly a um, a uh, private sector driven as in the American model, as you would expect. In you a want democracy. me to respond? <laughs> it's a long question. Yeah. Um, to begin with, India doesn't need that much state driven. It has enough soft power. It's not used. It has cuisine. It has uh, Hollywood, number two, by the Bollywood. way. Bollywood. Bollywood, <laughs> yeah. Which occasionally comes up with some winners. India has a lot of things going on. It's not hated by people as mm -hmm. sometimes China is. Mm -hmm. China is doing a lot to befriend also hate through this uh, forceful wolf warrior diplomacy. The diplomatic area, India has made some progress, I said. So you look around the world and ask India, and they're not threatened by India, whereas they are threatened by Chinese soft power too. They are closing down Confucian institutes all around the world as well. African students talk to them, but they, many of them have personal problems with this. So in a way, it's good India doesn't do all these things China does. It doesn't need it. It is getting enough social for power, but it is not going anywhere with the current strategy of Hindutva and all that. Mm. It's attracting the diaspora, basically, yeah. uh, because they think this is the way to go. Yeah. So there is a misperception what constitutes Indian civilization, its power, etc. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be worried about that in terms of India's soft power advancing. Mm -hmm. It is still a, a major civilization of the world, whether somebody is using it in the wrong way. Uh, so it has the elements, it, but of course, looks matter, as you said. That's, mm -hmm. uh, but I am I'm not so sure it has to compete too much with China. Mm -hmm. On the cultural part, civilizational part, Bollywood, Hollywood, whatever, um, but it has to compete with the educational part. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Uh, the pattern game, the, 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 the QS ranking, whatnot. They're trying to attract foreign universities now. But they're putting all these conditions. You know, Will anybody go there? I don't know. But the point is, they are realizing a little bit uh, the need for spending on education. And China is a challenge, the Chinese uh, successes in some of these soft power. But I think. China has to work very hard. Mm. India doesn't have to work that hard. That's mm. my ass assessment. Mm. It should not lose whatever it has. Uh, it has to build up hard. <laughs> this problem is it hasn't percolated into the Indian psyche yet that you are a major mega civilization, one of the seven that Huntington talks about, <laughs> if you want to use this clash of civilization. But at the same time, its attractiveness is going on in many parts. You know, yoga too. You know, Modi got this yoga day, but he didn't invent yoga, by the way. But there is a lot of appropriation of Indian culture, Indian uh, design. You know, others are using it, including the musicians of Beatles' time onwards. Indians don't mind that. Yeah. So I don't. I think this conscious effort to impose one's culture, civilization, eh, China is getting. You may think differently in being here or Asia Pacific, China is getting a very bad press today. 
in Canada and the United States. Uh, you know, I read many of them, and Canada especially. India is getting some, but not as bad as uh, it is because of the internal intolerance issues. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's going to go. And secondly, one thing I conclude is that, unfortunately, hard power matters the most. <laughs> unfortunately, I say, South Korea is fantastic, but you also respect for what it has achieved in hard power, its, its economy, its technology, you know, some things it really... But if you only have soft power, as India had a lot in 1960s, 50s, one war comes and you lose everything. You know, it, it is that problem of relying too much on soft power. It's important for legitimacy, durability, etc. But whatever progress India has made since 91, it is because of raw numbers to a great extent. The Indian culture was always there, no? It, mm. Why suddenly everybody is taking you seriously? So you need soft power, I, that's why. But I have identified some several areas, including diplomacy, which is a soft power, I think. Mm -hmm. How do you categorize hard power? Yeah. Where I think India has a pretty decent uh, top tier today, the foreign minister onwards. I mean, Modi has some instinct on that subject, by the way, is yeah. befriending people and all that. But yeah. the, some other policies are now hurting the other soft power that India should have. So it's a big topic, and the chapter is quite critical. And Yeah. Then, so, I mean... I'm not saying that China has a lot of soft power right now, but I'm saying it's making efforts to promote its soft power. I mean, but India. Who are the takers? Tell me. Huh? Who are the buyers of it? The people who are recipients Which, of mm, all no, that, the that's stuff. That's where you, you're wrong. There's a lot of hostility towards China. <laughs> there is, but there's also of that a lot of positivity. Because of that intense, you know, in your face yeah, effort. Yeah. No, no, no. So I'm saying that there are all these strategies. So I'm not talking about the end results to say. Yeah. But the strategies going forward, there is a deliberate effort to do that. So what I'm asking is, uh, was asking, and it's okay, we don't have to go yeah, on the it's very hard. I mean, I don't want to, first of all, I don't want to justify the Modi strategies. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable. No, no, exactly that's what I meant. Because I think that Indian civilization itself, Indian food, Indian culture, Indian, Indian uh, yoga, Attire. right, Attire. is Attire. by itself, very attractive. But unfortunately, there are all these cross currents that are happening yes. that are not helping Indian You are absolutely Indian right. That's in the chapter. So. Yeah, <laughs> great. Okay, I'll read it. Um, any uh, questions from, from the audience? My name is Saad. I'm from the business sector. I've been 16 years here and pretty yeah. global, globally. Okay. So I have uh, different questions. Okay, so first let me go on to the soft power. And uh, I don't think anybody is from here from the Indian Embassy. So. I like to defend somebody it's being from the taped, by the way. It's taped. No, it's fine. It's not a problem. I'm not, I'm not P.K. Basu, who was here a few years ago, who created a kiosk. Okay. So anyway, uh, on soft power, India has a lot of soft power. And let me go into that. Uh, just now, At uh, how India is working is in the, the latest earthquake in Turkey. Hmm. India sent a lot of relief and a lot of hmm. things which a lot of time India hmm. would not do. Mm -hmm. And if there's been any problem in India before, like the hurricanes and earthquakes and other things that other countries would send equipment to India. So recently, some problems with flooding happened, and India said, "No, we will do the flood. Uh, we will. We have our own people, and they have their own teams. They, in fact, India right now has a go-to team, and for floods and for earthquakes everywhere around the world, mm. and they can go on 24, 24 hours notice everywhere. So after the earthquake, what happened on the day of the earthquake? It happened at four o'clock in, in in Turkey. Right. By 11 o'clock, Indian aircraft were already landing in Anana." Air Force Base in Turkey mm. with supplies and equipment. This would have not been there even in the 80s or the 70s or 60s that India would have done that. So that's on the topic of soft power. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at it. But let me go back on, to the industry, on, on my question. I mean, we can be here for hours and debate on a debate, but I don't want to do that. So I'll just yeah. pick up the points that you said. And then, so we are talking about 1,000 years of Indian in, uh, of invasion into India, where, where you talked about it. That's the Hindu RSS, which you're talking about, mm. Mughals and Christians. Mm. So what happens there? We look at it, it's a very Delhi-centric Delhi uh, kind of historian you are. You're I'm not about, defending that. No, 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 I'm not talking about it. I'm just telling you that mm. it was not whole of India. It's just the Northeast. What happened in the Northeast, there was another invasion, which a lot of people came in from, the, from China, the North, and even from the Ahoms and the, a lot of people came in from Thailand and Myanmar into that side, which they have not looked at it. So that history has not been there, which is now is changing. Now let me go on to 
growing intolerance. We never talked about growing intolerance on that. Then on, on, the, on the question of, say, America, I think India really grew up on the Trump, uh, Trump administration, which really had a close relationship. And a lot of um, US, US and Indian military got together, and the Quad really came to effect that time. It wasn't before that. Then we looked at quit, quit India. And we looked at it. I think uh, we all come. And, we have all come, and we don't give. We all give Gandhi a lot of status on that. But there have been an other thing, and a lot of debate on that, and how the Indian naval mutiny actually saved India, and the Atli came into the, to, came into power, and that's what we look at it. We don't look at quit India. And if Winston Churchill had come in, and Winston Churchill never wanted India to gain freedom. Nuclear, uh, I won't go back to the other ones. Yeah, then can. let's go into India China, India thing, India, China, and then Chowan Le and Nehru had this great relationship, which we all talked about. And then right from- Must read the book. Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah. Okay, I won't go back. Then on the relationship that we talked about with India, China, then after that we had, India and Vietnam had a very strong relationship right from the Russian, from the USSR days. Mm -hmm. And they have maintained that relationship. And that's one of the reasons why both of us were attacked. Both of us had problems with, with China. So that's where the change came up. And na uh, let me go into naval power. India was a large naval power in the, in the, Ch in the Chola dynasty. And now it's come out. There's a movie on it, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Maratha Wanda, that famous thing from Kerala, who actually defeated the Portuguese, is another thing, another big, one of the big battles which the historians didn't talk about it. And uh, India always had an issue. Uh, we talk about India having growing powers, with Modi doing very well with, uh, with Middle East and Look East policy. But Indians still need a visa to all the countries in the Middle East. China, you don't need a you don't need a visa to go into any of the Middle East countries. China's came in a lot later, and they have picked up very strong business relationships in all of the Middle East countries. And look east. India it, is there too, by the way. I just visited uh, some of the Gulf no, countries. No, no, no. They're, they're, they're there. I know that. I've been in the Middle East. I was in the Middle East. I worked so on the business side. I know that side. Now, look on the look east side. We talk about. Uh, we talk about India's relationship with Lokis. I come from the Northeast. I come from Assam. My airport is Guwahati. I have one aircraft that comes from Bhutan to Singapore, and nobody flies on it. Kunming is one hour from, from Guwahati. Chun, Chengdu is so close. Lhasa is, is not even is a 45 minutes flight, and we don't have flights. There's one flight from Kunming to, to Calcutta. Um. I'm going to ask you to speed up yeah, sure. because That's other it. people yeah, need to ask the questions. All these micro details. Yeah, could you no, could no, you no, actually no, come no, to no, your no, question? No, yeah. Book yeah. is a big picture book. <laughs> there are all these points. Yeah, yeah. Some of them I yeah. cover. Some and of them I China cannot TV because it's a it's a big is, picture yeah. book. Yeah. So actually, do you, do you have a big question that you that you want to? Just these are those questions. I can go into a debate. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. We can debate after. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, TV I agree yeah. with many things he's saying, okay. but the point is that's all part of the story. It's a, it's a big story, you know, so it's narrative, yeah. Yeah. Um, questions? Oh, great. Focus questions so that yeah. be useful. This is a student from Ho Chong. Sure, yeah. So I guess I can <laughs> skip past the introduction. I think my only question is... Uh, oh, no, no, please tell, tell me your oh, name. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Eldon from yeah, Ho Chong Institution, and yeah. the uh, question I have is... Uh, do you think uh, that India has the potential to be the next global manufacturing hub and essentially replace yeah. China and thus awesome. whether uh, that could potentially be a big boost to its pursuit for status? Yeah. Good Thank question. You. Any other? Hello, Professor. I'm Claudia from the Institute of South Asian Studies. I have two questions. First is, um, we all know that India rejected BRI and is vocally opposed BRI, but it has supported and secured many projects under AIIB, which is China initiated and also has BRI funding. So how do you see that development? Mm -hmm. And my second question is relation to the emerging balance of power in Asia Pacific. So about a decade ago, there was an idea of a Russia-India-China trilateral. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the viability and relevance of this triad today? Thank you. Triad. Mm. Okay, good. Uh, good questions. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Justin. I'm an incoming undergraduate at uh, Leiden University. Awesome. So uh, my question to uh, Which Prof University? Uh, Leiden. 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 Uh, yeah. The Hague. Yeah. So uh, my question to Prof. D. V. Paul is: So uh, 
uh, it looks like one of the major problems India faces as a rising global power is the challenges posed by China, right? Mm -hmm. And at the start of your lecture, you mentioned Deborah Lassen. So one of uh, Lassen's uh, famous books, An uh, Anatomy of Mistrust, she talks about um, how there was a lot of mistrust and mutual suspicion between the US and Soviet Union during the Cold War. And she argues that, you know, if they built that mutual understanding early on, there wouldn't have been a lot of the problems. Mm. And I think there's a lot of relevance to that line of argument today, right? Not just between US and China, but also between uh, India and China. So um, could you comment a bit on, you know, how Mistrust there's this mutual suspicion, suspicion between mm. India and China and how uh, this could be addressed so that, you know, India could become... Uh, um, a better rising power, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Maybe we answer these uh, few questions. Yeah. This is quite a lot. I think the last yeah. one, please get a copy of Professor Kanti Bajpayee's book. <laughs> tells the, I'm promoting it because there he really describes these efforts by each other, not understanding. Sometimes they understood, sometimes they didn't. A lot of thinking going, passing each other, uh, reading about each other's history, and, and the notions of power and use of strategy, warfare, Asymmetric warfare, all kinds of things. Um, so this is a great topic of mistress. How did it happen? There were such bye-byes, brothers. Anyway, I won't go too much. It's a long story. Um, it is status also related. There is a mutual understanding of what whom we are. And Nehru thought we are co-equals. That is not what China accepted at that time. Uh, Russia, India, China trilateral have was immediately after the Cold War, there was a short-lived thing. I don't think it's there except for uh, occasional diplomatic meetings, maybe. I don't see that propping up. India has decided to join the West in many ways, not as a military ally, retaining its strategic autonomy, as, but India has no choice as China is growing rapidly, and India will have a threat if, quote-unquote, uh, to face, and so it's a hedging strategy. It is soft balancing, limited hard balancing, but it has evolved a lot more than what we already know because there is naval agreement, there's refueling agreement, there's a lot of agreements going on. Um, so I think India is uh, still in a strategic autonomy mode. The, the ball is in China's court. If it pushes hard on the border, I can guarantee you there will be an alliance with the West, serious alliance. There's no other way India can protect. Uh, it doesn't want another 62, as far as, as, far as I know. <coughs> OK. Rejected BRI. I think I mentioned AIAB was the last time China treated India as somewhat of a co-equal. This was holding its hand and giving it some role. You know, the where is the headquarters? Is in uh, Shanghai? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And the head of the group is an Indian. Something like there was a mutual agreement yeah. where India will have a stake. Come on, eh? come on to the first. first one. But there is a, a sharing of the, the money, 30% by India. Sorry, that's the first head of the NDB. NDB, OK. Yeah, In the any Chinese case, these the both head. banks, China is not the, the kind of uh, aggressive power you're looking at. It's not a unilateral effort by China. India was consulted. It is part of a joint effort. So, but BRI cut that whole thing whole process of co-equal or uh, co-sharing of Asia Pacific. So from an Indian point of view, honestly, if I'm deciding Delhi, BRI is like East India Company in many ways. You may disagree, people disagree, but it's a strategic project. <laughs> it's a project for hegemony. And it's a great project in many ways. But once you have infrastructural power, once you have massive economic power, it gives you hegemonic, this is American power, no, quite a bit, that dominance in trade, economy. So, but the, but the big question is, where is India's alternative policy? Where it really falters? It's talked about uh, Bishtek, and there is Africa corridor, yeah. Japan, Africa. None of that has really panned out, which really puzzles me, because it can develop many of those. Northeast, you're absolutely right. There's no reason why Northeast is not developed properly. Mm -hmm. And it should be connecting to ASEAN. All these are on paper. So there's a lot of lethargy on the Indian side. We all know that. Um, so the, the problem with China is Xi Jinping does not look want India to be a co-partner in here. And Modi doesn't want either. He wants to be a, treated as a pole of consequence. They are afraid of a G2 happening in Asia Pacific. 
A G2 means India will be a secondary state again. So this is a status fear, the, the anxiety that you had it for 3,000 years, then you lost it, and now a rare opportunity comes, and you really need to achieve at least at certain elites. And the challenge is obviously there. But whether they're learning the lessons and doing the right things, I don't think so, but that's a different story. Global manufacturing, yes, another good point. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought once they leave China, they will come to India. Barring uh, the latest Apple, I believe, Google a few here and there, and there's some talk about the chips coming back. I don't see a great Indian strategy to attract them. The Vietnam has done much better. As, uh, maybe Khandi can correct me uh, on this subject. So it's an interesting uh, situation. But it is growing, which is what I don't understand. 6.5% this year, <laughs> next year, <laughs> unless we don't believe those numbers. Mm -hmm. Because it's starting from the very bottom, and there's a domestic growth, huge consumer industry, uh, service industry. There's a lot of pockets of India are prospering without these paraphernalia of decent infrastructure or mm. airports and all that. There is a momentum in India. You know, there, there's happening there in places. People are sending their kids abroad, and some of them will come back. You know, maybe they will become part of this new generation. But then you have this intolerance that is happening, religious conflict, treating Muslims and others different. Uh, yeah. It's not falling apart, let's put it that way, but it has potential still. And not all great powers are equals. But China was not equal with the United States in any respect, in nine, except that it uh, prevented a defeat in the in Korean War. Or it, it, it prevented the US from winning, which, by the way, is a big status booster for China, to credit to Mao. Big risk, huge risk. And the fact that it didn't lose although a loss of 3 million people and another 3 million Koreans died, an enormous cost. But India doesn't have that history. It has got one history, that is, it stood up against the nuclear order and won. And most of the concessions, by the way, were made by the United States in that area, which is yeah. also to India's credit. Anyway, I'm a, a critic of many of the things you guys are all saying. I would like to do India better, but at the same time, uh, there is need for understanding the idea of identity, what it is that you want. And there India is confused, at least certain segments of India, whether it can go back to this civilizational identity of a religious identity, whether that will bring the glory. And the problem is even Hindu majority in Nepal doesn't think so. Mm -hmm. Barring the diaspora, unfortunately, who are uh, very smart, intelligent people, but some are not taught in any liberal arts colleges, and they are thinking in terms of this thousand year humiliation I just mentioned. And uh, unfortunately, they like the liberal order where they live in the West, but back home, they don't mind imposing a different order. Yeah, that's because you're not living at home. Yeah. Um, next set of questions, we'll quickly wrap that up. I mean, if you have one or two questions, you know, um, we can go a little bit. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bing Yang from River Valley High School, JC2 this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and personally, I would like to ask whether the reluctance of Indian citizens and lower level government leaders to uh, aim for great power status has firstly been caused by a lower degree to which India has been opened up to the global economy. For instance, per capita trade and trade as a proportion of GDP is much lower in India than in most ASEAN countries. Mm -hmm. Or is it possibly caused by something intrinsic to Indian civilization, in the sense that culturally, India is reluctant to promote and assert itself on the world stage, given that historically India has not really been an imperialistic or colonialistic power? Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Any, any other questions? We can collect a few and then... Uh, Thomas? Sure. Yeah, I always call on Thomas to answer questions, yeah. Hello. Um, How to I'm, ask questions. Yes, uh, yeah. I'm Thomas Mangiri. I'm here at the school in the International Affairs Program. Um, a question about democracy, um, so Indian democracy. I just wonder if you could say a few things about what you think um, the increasing Hindu nationalism in the Indian politics, how it will affect its democracy going forward, and what impacts it may have on India as becoming a, a leading, possibly a great power in the future. Thank you. Yeah. In case uh, Thomas didn't say it, but he's uh, second year in the MIA program. Robin? Yeah. 
another, uh, Robin is also another second year in the MIA program. I'm just doing introductions for your you safe time. You didn't mention he was my student at McGill. Yeah, he's also a <laughs> his student at McGill. I didn't so. know him at that time, but he <laughs> seems to remember me. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I guess a quick question just with regards to this region, specifically Southeast Asia, because we haven't really talked a lot about it, but um, you were mentioning China does get a lot of bad press, and even in this part of the world, we do, you know, you do see a lot of, you know, very so like negative perceptions of China, but on the other hand, it's still very like Southeast Asian countries are still very reliant mm -hmm. on China for, you know, in a bunch of sectors. So I guess my question would be, what do you foresee India's role could be to sort of like, you know, um, not necessarily balance, but just, you know, assert itself a bit more in the region compared to China? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I think that's the last set of questions for oh, TV. Very yeah. good. Um, go back in time for a happy hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Lower... Um, a reluctance to open up. India has opened up a lot. You probably, because I uh, am sure Kandi can remember 19, <laughs> 19, uh, when was that I landed in Delhi, 1979, 1980. There was one train from Kerala, where I come from, Kerala Express, two and a half days, no air conditioning, extreme heat, <laughs> and you just uh, suffer, you know, you get to Delhi where there is some level of uh, development. And, and then you, when I had enough money to fly, you never get a book ticket. Everything was so difficult. You are always standby. Mm -hmm. And you are pushing your way into the front to get the attention of the agent so that you will some. But all of us will get in somehow. <laughs> One flight. <laughs> India has come a long way. Anyone knows about India? Consumer goods. I remember I lived in Singapore, not Singapore, Malaysia for uh, six months, I was a deputation with the Malaysian News Agency. And the biggest request of all my relatives was bring me a TV from Singapore. <laughs> your uh, your uh, Mohammed Mustafa was still there, yeah. by the way. Uh, bring me this uh, latest uh, <laughs> shirts and T-shirts, whatnot. And they were ready to buy my T-shirts. I said, I'm, not, I'm just going to give it to you, but uh, generously. But the TV I had to carry for my brother, my God. <laughs> this was India, very closed place, extreme mindset was one of hostile to everybody else. It has come a long way. It's very globalized today, you know, for 500 TV channels, by the way, more than any other <laughs> countries I have been to. Yes, certain segment is really having a great time, but uh, it's, it's, uh, there is some fear of the rest, but I think it's much less than it used to be. Whether it is uh, utilizing all those globalization ideas, very big question mark. So I don't think opening up a trade, first of all, you have to have some assets to trade. Trade is one area where they're reluctant because this will affect the manufacturing. They're, they're not a manufacturing power yet. Southeast Asia and China are not a manufacturing focus. This is service-based. Uh, their big trade is what? Software, pharmaceuticals, Textiles. Uh, textiles, all these things, textiles not, uh, is not soft. You know, these are not requiring that much opening. They opened up those areas. But people only realize if they open up for the manufacturing also, they, you know, there will be a lot more. But there are a lot of problems in uh, that area of which economy they focus. Uh, Modi's policy of Atman Nirmar, as I pronounced, self-reliance. You know, it is a, it's a long story, and it's land acquisition to what not. So Southeast Asia is not a comparison. Some learnings they have, but not a whole lot. Uh, the politicians go and visit uh, Persian Gulf also, and then come back and do nothing about the roads or anything. So this is another complaint. Democracy's impact. Yes, democracy, as you know, is in decline almost everywhere, <laughs> backsliding, <laughs> including our beloved United States. Uh, the whole gerrymandering is unbelievable, you know. And in another 10, 15 years, we don't know, some say a civil war could happen as a result of this. So it's a global phenomenon, but it is, it's different in an Indian context because it is so tied to religion and uh, uh, isolation of groups that they don't want to be. Democracy's decline is a big part of my story because without that, India's soft power is really very little. The other things aren't that great to show, as you are absolutely right. Other things are there. I mean, it's been there for ever since Buddha came to the world. No? So it's not enough. Your model, if you have anything to show, is 
that a poor country can be a democracy, that secularism, yeah. that its minorities are treated well. Mm. Somehow it's not entering the, maybe it takes some years, maybe the BJP has to be in power for 50 years, then they realize, okay, we need to integrate these other folks without hurting their religion. They are newcomers, so they're really using this moment to assert their lost uh, call. I don't know, this is my gut feeling. But you're absolutely right. Without democracy, what is India? Mm -hmm. There are people who say, democracies don't perform. That's not true. I was talking the other day, of the top 20 countries, only one country is uh, not a democracy, that's China. I mean, the variations in the, the best performing quality of life, what not. So what do you want? It's just not material, but it's also, and India can never be a China. People just forget that this country is not going to become a China, and it's, uh, you don't have that work ethic, so, you know, it has its own variations, so diverse. So I don't know, democracy is a big worry. Mm. People, the youth are the problem. They are not learning democracy, the value, the civic consciousness. We don't teach. People are not born democratic you have, or liberal. You have to teach them in schools, in classrooms, in textbooks, or historical, philosophical readings. And America doesn't do that much. None of these democracies are doing it. So democracy promotion is, uh, is a socialization process is missing. Mm -hmm. um, quality democracy. Final question, what was it? I think I answered all that, no? Uh, final question. South Southeast Asia. Asia. Southeast Asia, yeah. Robin's question about Southeast Asia. Uh, you, can, you guys can uh, eliminate. My feeling is the ups and downs in that relationship. When Lukis came, there was some interaction much better. Then there was high expectation, and, and then actist, all this. And now I think they are so diffuse. The, the Indian diplomatic corps is very tiny, by the way. You know that, no? And they don't have enough people to focus on. So somehow they are not focusing sufficient as far as I know. But the Southeast Asians expect too much sometimes. <laughs> if I say so, this is not a most efficient country in many ways. It's going to take some time. And uh, a lot of these are a uh, matter of fact of time. But Southeast Asia needs India. That's why the ex in expectations the run, are high. What is the balancing possibility, if at all. And he asked the Vietnamese, and even increasingly the Philippines, they're buying Indian weapons. There is some understanding that there has to be some balancing force, not most effective, but at the same time, potentially. But uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, you know more than I do on this. Yeah, but Southeast Asia um, definitely wants India to be more, more involved active. Here. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, if you talk about civilizations, this part of the world is not just Chinese civilization. Which as we, Indian we all know. and as Islamic uh, influences. Uh, and we yeah, should but we debated this up the other day. The, if India comes and says, you know, we influenced you so much, you're going to hate it, and they'll say, no, you didn't do a whole lot. We adopted all this and built all this on our own. But when I go to Bali, I see South Indian villages there, I don't know. Much cleaner, nicer, and people are also much nicer. Thank you all for your audience, uh, for being here. Yes.